Well, we're going to do a little bit of a small series here that is called the Missio Dei, the mission of God. Let me explain what it is. Uh, one of the uniquenesses of the Bible, among others, from all other proposed documents of religion, is that the Bible has the glaring attribute of being a story. It's not a book of rules. It's not a book of regulations. It's, uh, it's not a book even about primarily simply about morality. It's a, it's a book about the story of God. It's an autobiography by God about himself, about the work of the Father to plan, the work of the Son to accomplish, the work of the Holy Spirit to uh, bring it unto men. Uh, it is a story about the creation, the fall of man, redemption through Jesus Christ, and bringing man not just back where he was, but back to higher than he would have been. It is a story about paradise given, paradise lost, and paradise regained. Few, however, can see this, mostly because most people read their Bible in little snippets, and all they gather are little stories here and rules here, and, uh, and prophecies here, and they never linger long enough to put it into its story. It's a story about the Missio Dei, about the purpose and the mission of God. Uh, and the reason I share this is that in our church, we spend between four and five million dollars a year on missions. And we do that not because we give a tip to missionary organizations. But whenever you look at the church in the book of Acts and, and following, and all through the Old Testament, what God is doing, the church's major purpose is that of a mission. We've got something to do. That's why at the end of Matthew, it says, you'll be my, or rather, uh, make disciples of all nations. The book of Mark says, preach to all creation. Luke, preach to every creature. The book of John, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses. And then you see the movement of the church from the book of Romans and following to the very end of time and those last events of the tribulation that follow the last days of the church. And it ends with John's word as a Christian, come soon, Lord Jesus. And so what is the Missio Dei? I'm going to start this morning in Genesis 1 and we'll go to Revelation 21. What do you say? We're going to be here for 19 hours. And so call home if you need. No. How many of you uh, came an hour ago to the first service? I'm just wondering. And you were ready for church to start. Well, here you are. Stay with me. If you read the Bible in a sitting, and if you were just a rational individual and you read it in a sitting, this is what it would say. That you've got the creation out of nothing and everything, all things are headed by God. Nature, the animal realm, man, they are all headed by God. He is called El Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That all of the earth, from the smallest flea to the Milky Way, they are there by God for his purposes. Everything is ruled by God. And then you go to the creation of the regent, the one who is to exercise as the foreman, the divine will, a creature that is called the son of God, Adam. And Adam is from Adam. He is from the earth. He is in the image of God, but he is created. And all men will come from this one man. Acts 17, 26, God made from one every nation under mankind. His job is to obey God and to partake of the tree of life and to seal his immortality. Then he is made to rule the creation. He is made to multiply, to subdue it, and to establish the kingdom of God, the ruling of the earth by man, the vice regent of God, that, that the steward of God that responds to God over his rule of the earth and his glory to God. And by, I'm sorry, what's the beginning of the Bible? Genesis, 
And by Genesis chapter 2, everything's hunky-dory. Everything is in union between God and his creation by virtue of the obedience of man. There is peace in heaven and on earth. And then you see the temptation. You see the fall where the glory of God is going to be demonstrated to the angelic realm. Another sermon for another day. Hang on, we'll get there someday. But you know what happened, and that was the fall. That the temptation was to be as God. Don't eat of the tree of life and be submissive to God. There is a life, Adam, you don't know. And it comes by breaking free. You think you enjoy life. That's because you're a darkened individual to God. Break free. Get your motor running way out on the highway. Like a true nature's child, you're born, born to be wild. You'll know good and evil yourself without this baggage that is called God. Be free and get rid of him. Wouldn't you like to ride in my beautiful balloon? It's something like that. I forget one. And so Adam sinned. And as a result, Paul said, and Adam all sinned and death spread to all men. And so when you conceive and give birth to a child, they are born in darkness unto God unless they are informed. They are, have a nature that is going to be in defiance of God. Amen. Unless they are disciplined. And they will proceed unto death. Darkness, defiance, and death. Thank you, Satan, for what you gave us. And so the creation now has a red dye going out to all of it of independence. Nature is cursed. The animal realm is cursed. Man is cursed. The wife is cursed. The mother is cursed. The child is now born as a son of disobedience, a child of wrath. And unless they are reborn, that they will proceed unto death and, and judgment. And as soon as that occurs, God gives a promise. It's called the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. Where is the gospel given first in the Bible? The fall comes in Genesis 3, uh, 14, where sin is announced. Redemption comes in Genesis 3, 15. One sentence after sin. It's the oldest religion known to man. It's the only religion that's a divine religion. God says, I'll put enmity, Satan, between your seed, natural man, and her seed, the seed of woman. There's going to be one man that in some way will not have a natural birth. It's as though he'll be a virgin-born child. He will not have a sin nature. And it says, and he, this male child, singular male pronoun, he, this boy, will crush your head, Satan, just like a snake, and you will wound his heel. And so God will get rid of sin, Satan, and death through nothing that man does. It's like the day of atonement. You will sit and do nothing. And the blood of a animal who dies for you is presented before God. And you, on the basis of that atonement, will enter into God's presence. And so the oldest religion is representative religion, where someone dies for what you did, and you can live on account of his merits, that he will be a king and he will be a priest. He will be a wounded deity that becomes a man for you. It anticipates Christmas and Easter. The Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel, Genesis 3.15. And so that solution is to go out to all mankind, all that was created by God, all that fell under Adam, all will now be able to be reconciled through this one person. Uh, it will not be through human works. It will not be by your dying and reincarnating to a higher level based on your good karma, which is nothing but a retributory religion. It is not your meditating on the eightfold path and putting an end to the sin nature you have and hitting nirvana. It is not your following the five... Uh, the fivefold foundations of Islam 
and dying with your fingers crossed that your he that whose scale is heavy dwells in bliss. He whose scale is light will dwell in the eternal judgment. No, you will do nothing but trust in what this person will do in dying for what you did. And then fourthly or fifthly, you see that after mankind, God, uh, after the fall, God establishes sacrifice in the garden. A lamb dies, anticipating the coming of the Lamb of God who will end religion, and he himself will be the, the, the final salvific thing. All sacrifices will anticipate him until he dies, and then the old covenant will be removed. And so all of the planet was corrupted because the sons of God saw the daughters of men were pleasant and they went into them. Don't worry, it's another sermon for another day. We'll get to it about 2027. Okay. But you see that the entire earth was corrupted save Noah. And in the flood, how much of man was destroyed? All of it was destroyed. I'm hoping you're seeing that in the Bible, you don't see that there is Judaism and other ideas, Christianity and other ideas, all of which are valid and are approaches to the same God. No. God deals with everybody in creation, everybody in the fall, everybody in the coming of Messiah, and everybody judged in the flood. And then all the earth will come from the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. All the nations will come from them. And so we're going to start over, but what do we have? The Garden of Eden all over again of a rebellion. Man does not spread out, obey God, keep sacrifice. No, man journey, comes together and builds a ziggurat. It's like a big sloped pyramid, a tower. It's called the tower that is the gate of God. Bab El is the, Hebrew, is the Babylonian word. Bab El means the gate of God. It means that we're God. We'll build a city. We'll build a tower to make a name for ourselves that we won't be scattered because we're scared. That's why we need to make ourselves God. We're scared of being separated. And uh, God said they're all of one tongue. There's no evil that they will be unable to do. There's nothing that will be impossible. Whenever you have 12 uh, 12 year old boys in a 6th grade class sitting together Will that bring great good? They're all unified. Will that bring great good? It will bring the end of civilization. So what are you going to do if you're a teacher? Kill them. But you can't. You can't. They'll fire you. But what can you do? Separate them. Will you end the evil? No, but you'll slow it down until they all go to seed and make for greater evil where they are. Okay. But you can slow the evil down. So God changes their, he strikes them and brings disunity. And now you begin to intermarry within your language group. And pretty soon traits dominate and we have the races. You never see gods mentioned before the Tower of Babel. Afterward, now you see the gods. Man invents his own religions. Well, Except for one nation, all the nations, all the nations go out from Tower of Babel. They're all spread out. That's why the, the evil is, most evil time in the Bible is the end of Revelation, where all the nations come together again under one world religion and one world government. And what's the name of it? Babylon the Great. And so now they all go off into their different isms and asms. Except for one nation, God will have his own divine nation that will carry on the knowledge of the creation, the fall, the proto-evangelion, the coming of Messiah. It's going to be a miracle nation. We're going to take it and raise it up from the darkness of a woman's dead womb. We're going to take Abram, 75, Sarah, 75, and we're going to raise up a miracle child, Isaac. Isaac means to laugh. Look what God did, unbelievable. Look what he did. You just laugh at what God did. And then we'll have a son, Jacob, and then there'll be 12 sons. And they become the patriarchs, the beginning of the nation of Israel. And God gives a covenant. Abraham, I'm going to give you land, the land of Israel, of Canaan. 
And then I'm going to give you seed to fill that. We're going to change your name from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, God of a multitude. And then in your seed, singular, in one Hebrew boy shall the nations, all those of Babel, be blessed. We pretty much represent the nations. Are we all, do we all have one thing in common? We all come together because of our love of one particular Jew who goes back to Jacob, back to Isaac, back to Abraham, back to Shem, back to Noah, back to Adam, and the seed of woman to crush the serpent's head. And so in you and in, in your seed, singular, shall the nations be blessed all of the nations. You don't get to, as a Gentile, invent your own way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And how many come to the Father but through Him? No one. You come any other way, and you're exempted by the threshold of the holiness of God. You come with the nail-pierced King, or you don't come at all. Better off to be in hell than to be in heaven without Christ. Don't you come. Well, out of those 12 sons come the Jewish nation. They failed. They attempted fratricide and took their brother and killed him. His name was Joseph. And they didn't like him because he was a good shepherd. And he brought back to the father whom he loved words of his, the brother's that refused to submit to the father and now wanted to kill the chosen son. And so he goes into Egypt, a famine comes, the brothers come to Egypt to be taken care of him, who has become the king of Egypt, who has become the sovereign underneath Pharaoh at his right hand, the bread of life. And he breaks the brothers and brings them to repentance and sorrow, and he bestows upon them the bread of life, Joseph. And that nation stays there in Egypt for 400 years and becomes 2 million people, like the sand of, this, of the earth, like the stars of the sky, just like God said. And then God delivers them from Egypt by divine power, just like they had their origin through nothing of their own. They have their redemption through nothing of their own. And God takes them out and they come to Sinai. And there God gives them what he gave no other nation, a written document. This is who I am. And I will meet you at this document. He gave the law. He gave the temple ceremony. What's the temple ceremony? Do not approach God. Let the high priest come to God for you. You sit and do nothing. And you trust in the death of that lamb for you. And you will be declared righteous. So they preserve the knowledge of the creator of the sin of man, the redeemer, divine law. It's found in the nation of Israel, whom God says in Exodus 19, 6, that you'll be a royal priesthood. What's a priest? It represents somebody to everybody. And Israel will represent God to mankind. Not India, not Arabia, not America, not France, not Germany, not Italy. You will know God through the Jew and his document. That's why if somebody bikes up to your door and has a supposed knowledge of God that does not come from the Bible, Jesus said salvation is of the Jew. You help them on their way to bike on down the road. Okay. And so Israel, however, how did they do with the divine law? They rebelled against God at the at Mount Sinai with a golden calf. Then they rebelled against Moses. They rebelled against the judges God sent them. They rebelled against Samuel, rebelled against the kings. They had a good king, David, who fell into adultery and murder. And then the northern kingdom separated and fell in. They had 20 different kings. All were idolaters. They were judged by the Assyrians in the 8th century uh, or 722 B.C. and destroyed from the face of the earth. Uh, Judah and Benjamin where the temple was 
Then 586, they followed after false gods. They had 20 kings and only about six of them were any good. And they were judged and sent into Babylon. And it began what is called the times of the Gentiles to where the light of the world, Israel, was ruled by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And at their lowest point under Rome, here came a bright night and an angel appeared. And said, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. For unto you this day in the city of David, just like God said, is born a Savior, Messiah, the Lord, a baby. Did you catch that? God, a baby, Messiah. And uh, peace, glory to God in the highest in heaven and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is well pleased. His sovereign grace. And so, Messiah came. The problem with Israel, he came to his own and his own received him not. They rejected him. How come? Because he was no different than Samuel. He was no different than David. He was no different than Moses. He held to the truth. And the truth was that the law of God is not a set of rungs whereby you can climb to save yourself. It's a... It's a Pick, it's a, a mirror to show you who God is, and in that light, you see your sin. That's why the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus, and then that book that you always quit when you're reading the Bible through in a year, Leviticus. <laughs> it's about sacrifice. Why does the book on sacrifice follow the book of law? Because you can't keep law. Someone must die. And so the notion that you come to God on the basis of the shedding of blood of sacrifice that preceded Christ, that notion was lost to Israel. Can a culture lose the knowledge of God as generations roll on? Yeah. And they thought that Messiah would be a political deliverer, like the, a king like the Gentiles. He would be a Simon Maccabees, and he would bring political deliverance. And that's why when Jesus, on his triumphal entry on, at Easter, went into Jerusalem, he, they, everybody came out cheering. You know what Jesus did? He cried. He said, Jerusalem, if you'd known the things that make for peace, it's not politicians. The problem isn't the Romans. The problem's you. And you, you wouldn't repent. And you're going to end up killing me, which you did. We have no king but Caesar. And so they rejected his words. They rejected his miracles, his works. He simply said, you do him of the devil. And they put him on a cross and they tortured him for six hours, tried him six times, found him innocent six times and killed him because he claimed to be the son of God. Uh, can God use evil things to bring about good things? Just like the creation came out of darkness, Israel came out of the darkness of a dead womb, just like they came out of Egypt through no works, God would save man, not merely through no works of man, but all mankind would be set against his solution. They took this person, they tortured him, they killed him, they put him on a cross. And yet the Bible says that Satan didn't do it, Judas didn't do it, Herod didn't do it, Pilate didn't do it, Israel didn't do it. What's John 3.16? 3, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Who was behind the death and resurrection of Christ? God. Is God that big? Remember the riddle of, of uh, Samson? Uh, out of something bitter came something sweet. Out of the destroyer came something to eat. God can use a Joseph that is rejected to bring about redemption. He can use even a Messiah that is rejected through the common hatred of the Latin, the Greek, and the Jew, the three languages of the cross. And they put him to death. And yet on that cross, God took his wrath and laid it upon him. And he was separated and cried out, why? For no reason of his own. Why have you forsaken me? And he paid for the justice of God, the sin of man. And thus the bridge was built from heaven to earth. And nobody can say that man invented it. Because even the apostles couldn't figure out what was happening. And so, that death of Christ was Normandy. 
when we went after Hitler, Mussolini, and all the rest, we took it to them. And we landed on Normandy. And man, my father-in-law was in, uh, was there in the region. And he said, you've never seen blood red surf. And he said, it will change your life to see blood red surf with the bodies of young men washed up. And it cost us at Normandy. And Hitler didn't want to give it up, but we took it. And then we just started moving, heading toward Berlin, where, as Patton said, we would then personally shoot that paper hanging individual. Okay, <laughs> so that's what happened. Normandy was heaven's landing down here. That was the, the cross of Christ. It was Normandy. We, there had been a beachhead on earth. And now what happened is you began the, the reconquest began. If you put a title on the Bible of a novel, you'd call it The Empire Strikes Back. Because now heaven starts moving toward God being all in all. When Christ rose, only Jesus knew who he was. Pretty soon the thief on the cross, then the guy that put him to death, 5,000 at, Pil at Pentecost, another 3,000. Then Paul is converted. Then here we are in Antioch. Here we are in Galatia. Here we are in Asia. Here we are in Philippi. Then all of a sudden we're in Rome. And then the Roman Empire comes down. The church still stands. All of the heathen now come in and get converted by the, the only thing that was remaining of the Roman Empire that was Christianity. That's where most of us came from, was the conversion of Europe and the heathen by, by incipient Christianity that was still there. And then we start moving and we jump the ocean and we go down into South America. We go up into North America. The pilgrims show up here. We take the new world. By the 1800s, we're going into the East and Christianity becomes the largest religion ever known among men. And it has no capital that you worship toward. You only lift your eyes and you look to heaven. There's no certain race that it's part of. It's all races assembling together. Well, you begin now the great commission. Make disciples of all nations. To the Jew first. Peter goes to the Jew. They rejected him. Paul goes to the Jew. They rejected him. Uh, Stephen goes to the Jew. They rejected him. So now he goes to the Gentile. And now we have the odd phenomena of the church age. The creation is making something from nothing. Uh, the, uh, after Noah lands, it's making something out of three men, just like the creation. At uh, the birth of Isaac, it is something from nothing. Leaving under Moses, you get something from nothing. And the death of Christ, there is something from adversity that comes out of it. So now in the age of the church, it's also called the day of salvation. It's called the favorable year of the Lord. That you have the true God worshipped by what? Isaac and Moses and David? No, it's Germans and Chinese and Koreans and Irish and Italians. Guys from College Station. See? You just get this situation that you go, how in God's name did this happen? That the God of the earth, the God of Israel, is being worshipped by, look around. We all trace ourselves back to the Tower of Babel. Unless you're a converted Jew and trace it back to Isaac. We trace ourselves back to the Tower of Babel. And so it's this amazing situation this can only be of God that the enemies are the preachers. Go figure. Well, now in the day of salvation, 1 Tim 2, uh, God desires all men to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all the testimony born at the proper time in history. 
Who's going to come? Many are called. Few are chosen. Jesus said, all the Father gives me, they will come to me. The one who comes to me, I'll not cast out, and I'll raise him on the last day. It's the elect. The gospel goes out to many. The sheep, they hear my voice. Another they will not follow. John 10. They follow me and I give eternal life to them. They'll never perish. And he said, I have sheep of another flock. And I'm going to go get them. That they will be one flock with one shepherd. He was talking to the 12. I'm going to get sheep of another flock. I'm going to make them one. Who's the other flock? It's you, the Gentile. And so we gather them all together. Uh, it's called the church age. It's called the favorable day of the Lord. Paul said, now is the day of salvation. It took Moses 100 years to build that ark. You had 100 years to make a decision. But once the flood comes and that door is shut, now you're in a world of hurt. And so this age of grace has gone on for 20 centuries. If you were God, would your Bible be that thick? Would you have been that patient? 20 centuries, God has been merciful. The gospel has circled the world. Well, this age isn't going to go on forever. God, the Bible says, hath commanded men everywhere to repent. He commands India to be done with its idols and its Hinduism and its monism and its pantheism and worship the true God that is over the creation. Has India repented? Have they? No, they have not. Has China repented of its, now its atheism and communism? They have not. Has Russia repented? Has America repented of its secularism and its atheism and its humanism? It has not. Has uh, England or, or all of Europe repented of their Western secularism and the rejection philosophically of the infinite person of God? They have not. Has Italy repented of its Catholicism and looked to faith alone to be saved? They have not. And so God hath commanded men everywhere to repent, and they are not repenting. Only select people that are coming out that are the ecclesia, the called out, the church. That's all we see. And so, what are we going to do? God will have his day. Before the judgment comes, the very last of the Bible looks at seven years. It's called the day of Jacob's trouble. It's called the tribulation. It's called the day of wrath. It's called the day of the Lord. Did you ever see Forrest Gump? Remember when Lieutenant Dan is cursing up in the, in the uh, boat and all of a sudden Hurricane Carla shows up? And Forrest says, and then God showed up. Well, that's the day of the Lord. It's when God shows up. Before he does, though, we can't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah till we get Lot out. We can't destroy Jericho till we get Rahab out. We can't destroy the old world till we get Enoch up, Methuselah dies, and Moses gets in the boat. Is God going to destroy the world and just catch us all by surprise? Is that the hope of Christianity, is the wrath of God? The tribulation period is not persecution. It's the wrath of God. And so is that our Christian hope, the wrath of God? Look in your hymnal sometimes under blessed wrath, take me, take me. All right. You're not going to find it. Okay. Hit me with a hundred pound stale pale hailstone, oh God, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on, yay. We just don't sing that often. Oh, for a scorpion that would sting me for five months. I don't think we, that's not in there. I wrote one, but it, it just doesn't sell. All right. Now, what is the hope of the believer? That God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation. The Greek word for to pluck, pluck is the word harpazo. When you play an instrument that you pluck the strings, it's called a what? Harp. A very vile woman with long hair and great teeth that comes down and seizes you and takes you away and eats you, it's called a harpy. I don't know why I just thought about that. All right. <laughs> they pluck you. Okay. The Latin word for harpazo is the word wrapped, R-A-P-T. And you wrap a paper. And so there's going to be an event where the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. 
the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, their bodies will rise first because they got six more feet to go. They come up. Their spirits are in heaven, but their body comes up. And then we who are, who are alive shall be harpazo, plucked up. We use the word in our English Bible, rapture. They shall be caught up, raptured to God in the clouds, and thus we shall all be together with the Lord. What's the purpose of the rapture? To remove the restrainer of the church and to enlighten the nation of Israel. When you go to the tribulation period in the book of Revelation, there are people you never see between Revelation 6 and 19, the word church, we're not here. But you do see preachers, 144,000 Billy Grahams, 12,000 from the 12 tribes. It's Israel. They got enlightened once the church was gone. Now Israel finally becomes the nation of priests to preach, finally. And it's a judgment of the world for its renunciation of God since the Tower of Babel. And it is uh, to alert the world that he's coming. Well, then God says, come, Antichrist is revealed, and for seven years, judgment and the wrath of God comes. Jesus said all life would have been destroyed. He said a tribulation has occurred since it's not occurred since the foundation of the world. There is no paradigm for what happens. There's no paradigm. The Bible says that when Christ returns, Man shall be as gold on the earth. He'll be so rare on the earth. And so before, it's another sermon for another day, before the nations all come together to destroy the one holdout on truth, Israel. Before the nations come together to do so, all of a sudden the eastern sky opens. And it's now the intervention of heaven upon the earth. And it is the second coming of Christ. The Bible says men shall see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. I don't think you'll merely see Christ. You'll see the ultimate paradigm shift. The heavens open. It says the earthly lights go dark, just like at the cross, and the heavens open. We have no idea what that means. Dwight Pentecost, when I was at seminary, he used to say it's like the Thanksgiving Day parade. You don't just see Santa Claus. You see first the horses. You see the rodeo guys. Then you see the bands, all the high school guys. Then you see the Shriners on their little bitty motor scooters. And then at the end of all of this procession, the crowd rises in glory. Here's Santa throwing out candy. All right. And he said, that is the second coming. You will see the angelic realm. The spirits of righteous men made complete. Old Testament saints, their glory. You'll see the church in fine linen, bright and clean. And then you'll see the king. I remember Dr. Pentecost saying, and he lived back then in the, uh, at the, in the New Testament age. But I remember him saying, we can look at the certain days of the book of Daniel, he said, and there's 40 days unaccounted for. That's what he said. And I've seen what he was talking about. It's in like in Daniel 11, Daniel 12, Daniel 12. And he said, I think those 40 days are the second coming. He said, I think it's a month long event when heaven will come to roost on the earth. And then the Bible says that you have the messianic kingdom established after the judgment of the earth. There may not be half a million people on planet earth at that time. And so he assembles first the Jew who was looking for him and who bore the mark of the beast. And he shall say like virgins who were looking for the coming of the king with oil in their lamp at any time they're ready. Come into my kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. Those that ran off because they weren't ready, I do not know you. Depart from me. He'll judge the Jew first and then he judges the world. You know how he does it? He separates the sheep from the goats and he says to the sheep, come into my kingdom because I was in, this is the Gentiles. I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me drink and I was naked and you clothed me and I was in prison and you visited me. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked and, or in prison? He says, whatever you did to the least of my brethren, 
that you did to me. Who are the believing brethren that the Gentile would have to care for in the tribulation? The Jew, the believing Jew. You know, if you ever go to Yad Vashim, the Holocaust Museum, you'll see what are called the, oak, the grove of the righteous Gentiles. Israel planted trees, oak trees, for Gentiles that laid it on the line in World War II in the Holocaust. And they honor them today. You'll see a tree with a plaque under it that says Oscar Schindler. And then you see another tree that's behind, at least when I was there, it's behind uh, chain link because it kept dying because everybody would go by it and see it and they would tear off a leaf or a twig until it just died. It was about a little Dutch watchmaker's daughter named Cory ten Boom, Ben Ten Boom. We count those blessed who endured. Well, that's how God will know the faithful in the tribulation that lived in the Gent among the Gentiles. Were you willing to suffer with my people? Yes, we were. Come on in. Just like with us, God knows who the believers are. Those that will suffer with his son. Amen? Those that will go public. That's how you know the real believer. That's who he can tell has salvation. Depart from me into the fire for the devil and his angels because I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When did we see this and not do this? Whatever you did to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Be gone. And so who will go into the kingdom that is wicked? None. You may not have 300,000 Jews and 200,000 Gentiles. It'll be that small. And now where are you going to be during this? You'll rule with him. You'll return with him and you'll rule with him. And I will too. The Bible says if we uh, suffer with him, we shall rule. What will you rule? That's to be determined by your life. It's called the Bema, the judgment seat. When God will take us and God will see what we have done for human glory and what we have done for his glory. It's not a punishment. Are you glad? Because our sin's already been punished. Amen? Everybody do like it. <laughs> We're glad. Sin's already punished. But it's a remuneration. If you're a plumber and you did it for the glory of God, if you're a preacher and you did it just so people can look at you, we're going to recognize that. And so he will take your life. Here's Kendall. <laughs> Hello. There it is. Kendall, you'll rule over Tioga. Okay. <laughs> Corey Ten Boom. <laughs> Nothing moved. You'll be over Chicago. Okay. Lord, your mind made five minus more. You'll be over five cities. Lord, your mind made ten minus more. You'll be over ten cities. You'll be amazed. And then he'll rule for a thousand years. We'll go into the kingdom and everything will be headed by God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that those, and for a thousand years, you're going to have normal people down here. Is there going to be a devil? He'll be bound. Is there going to be an earthly pressure? No, you won't have the world as such. Christ will rule. Uh, are men still going to have to believe to be saved? Yes. What will you believe in? Christ. Christ who came and died? No, who Christ came and died and returned and ruled. And there he is in Jerusalem. And the nations will go up, Zechariah 14, and worship the king. So you will have the king. Now we see in a mirror dimly. Then, face to face, you'll see him. And so, during the kingdom, babies will be born the earth will grow huge, and we're going to have a problem. What will the problem be? Teenagers. Those born within the kingdom that have to learn about sin by faith. The world used to be a sinful place. No. Yes. Even with a wounded king? Yes. Even with a wounded king. Men will feign obedience, it says, for the fear of God. Then Satan is released for a short period. Every dispensation has to have a test. In the garden, in the time of conscience, in the time of the flood where government can remove wicked men from the flood on, the time of the patriarchs, it was the test of Joseph, uh, the coming of Christ, our test is right now because we are aliens in a pagan world. So our test is right now. 
And then the kingdom period has a test. Satan is released for a short time. He tempts the nations. The Bible doesn't give you but a couple of verses on this. Events prior to Genesis on the angelic fall, the Bible can't speak a lot about. Events after the return, the Bible can't speak a lot because it's too supernatural. And man gets screwed up with supernatural notions. God can't tell you the angelic names until the book of Daniel. And that's only Gabriel and Michael. That's all I'll tell you. And so man can't handle angels and demons. He tends to want to worship them. And so God gives you a minimum of information. A lot about God. Very little about supernatural, metaphysical occurrences. Man can't handle it. California can barely handle, you know, like salt and pepper or something like that. And so he can't give you a whole lot. But there's going to be a temptation. I think the temptation will be the same as in the garden. You've enjoyed life, but it's all an illusion. You're under the authority of God. You need to f free yourself. You need to fly and be done with him. You know what happens? All it says is the nations gather outside the holy city for the war. Man fails again. Now, if you're God, what are you going to do? You had a garden of Eden. Man rebelled. You had the Proto-Evangelion. Man rebelled. You had uh, the flood and man rebelled against government. The patriarchs and the Jews rebelled. The law and Israel rebelled. Grace, the world has rejected him. The kingdom, those born after it, will rebel, Revelation 20. If you're God, what are you going to do? You've done everything. There's only one thing left. Burn the whole thing down. And that's what he will do. It's judgment day. It says the elements will melt with intense heat. The earth and its works will be burned up. And then it says there is the great white throne. Hades, the, rest, the, the place that the wicked dead go to. It is now, it vomits forth its own. And they all stand, every wicked person since Cain, to the end of the tribulation, stand before God in a resurrected body to be able to endure hell. They stand before God. And the books are opened and their life is looked at. And the book of life is open as to whether they have believed in the mercy of God and repented. And their name is not found. And they depart into hell proper. Hell may not be big as a softball. I've often wondered if it's just a black hole with no light coming out and nothing but heat. And so they disappear into a place where there is nothing of God that can ever bother them. No creation, no personhood, no, well, I guess there's personhood, but no communion, no fellowship, no family. There's nothing but you stimulated by what you love the most, and that is you forever. You wanted no God, you have no God, and you will have none of his perks that you have enjoyed without glorifying him. You have you, and it's a family reunion of the damned. You have you. And then he makes new heavens and new earth. Gracious. What's the new universe going to look like? We don't know. It's only in the mind of God. The holy city, a ziggurat, not the Tower of Babel. It's 1,500 miles high, long, wide, the water of life coming down, the tree of life on all sides, taken in like communion for the healing of the nations. There is love. There is no sun, for there's nothing but light. There is no night. We're all awake. We never need to be refreshed. And it, from one second, you think this is as good as it can get. Then you find out the next second is better. And it goes on eternally because we look on him. The Bible never says we're all caught up. It's not like heaven. We're all simply excited about eating where we can't get fat, you know. No, it's God. You look on the source of everything. And then at this point, Paul says what Drew Anderson read to you. It's at this point that Christ now delivers up the kingdom. The last enemy underfoot is death, and it's been conquered. And so now, Revelation 22, 1 through 5, you don't look to Christ as a mediator and trust in the Father you can't see. Now, God dwells among us, and it says, and this is the ultimate, ultimate climax of the Bible, it says, and they shall see his face. The origin of every delight 
There's where it started. You like music? This is where it started. You like rhythm? This is where it started. You like beauty? This is where it started. You like love? This is where it started. You like any delight? This is the mouth of the river. Life was the delta. And you're going to see it. What no man can look upon and live, you're going to see it. And we'll see it together. Isn't that great? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He planned, He died, and He brought men to the knowledge of it. And so all eternity shall express the Trinity. And then it just says, and they shall reign forever, and heaven signs off. Boop. It signs off. What do we see beyond that? You got to die to go see it. You got to die. And so it's kind of like Robin Hood. King Richard, is, he goes away and a bad guy takes over, King John. And he oppresses the people, except for one guy, Robin. He stands for good, rebels against evil, and he frees men from evil's dominion. And there are certain kind of men. What kind of men are they? Merry men. They're always happy. But they ain't got much. But they have each other and they have the right. And they all hope someday Richard's coming back. And Richard shows up. If you've seen the cartoon. Richard shows up. And Robin doesn't know who he is. And he says, don't you need to bow, young man? And Robin, not knowing, says, I bow to none but my king. And Richard pulls back his garment. And there is the red cross, the escutcheon of Richard. And Robin and his men kneel. And Robin now steps back from his men. And he delivers up the kingdom to his sovereign. And Richard is all in all. And that's what we're moving toward. And that is why we do missions. Because we're, in, we're working with God. Two greatest questions you've got to ask. Why did God save me? That's the question of grace. And then why has he left me here? Why has he left me here? Missions. Purpose. That's why we don't just baptize people and hold them under and send them to glory. See? I've thought about it. God has a purpose for us. Isn't that great? Pray with me. And then we need a hymn. Oh, yes. Father in heaven, we dismiss on this day thanking you for the beauty of your word and the story of the Missio Dei, the mission of God. What on earth God is doing for heaven's sake. And we thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your might. Thank you for your glory. And thank you that you included us as a trophy of grace to all the angelic realm. You included us. Thank you. And if there is a man or a woman, a boy or a girl that is here this morning, still looking to themselves for redemption, lift their eyes to the revelation of God, the beauty of his son, the mightiness of his salvation, and the joy of being right with him. God, would they ponder on this. And as we in these next few weeks look at missions, that you would let us know there's something here a lot bigger than us. There's a time when men lay aside their toys and they go to war. And we'll thank you through Christ our Lord. Amen. We need a hymn, but this one is kind of soft and smooth. And so I treat, retreat to the sanctity of the Holy Rocker. All right. Oh, I may just preach from this forever. My man, Nathan McCarter, full blood uh, Seminole Indian, <laughs> walked from the Everglades to Denton. Nathan, give us something here. See if you know this. How many of you know that? Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, thou of God, man the Son. Thee will I cherish, thee will I honor. Thou my soul's glory, joy and crown. 
fairest Lord Jesus. Where are we, Nathan? Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish, Thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight. And all the twinkling starry host, Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels have. Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forever. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning of worship, this morning of song, this morning of the appraisal of the great story of God, of the Father's decree, the Son's enactment, and the Spirit of God's bringing it to fruition, selling the notion to his creation. Thank you for your creation and for your recreation for your word that brought forth the heavens and your word that brought forth light into our souls. And Father, we recognize that we are in the chasm between the cross and the crown, calling men to look back and fear not to look forward. And so every day as we go out to those in our business, to those in our neighborhood, to those in our family, to those where we traffic in life, that you would bring questions around to the deeper issues, the issues of life, and that we might be able to give an account for the hope that is in us with gentleness and with patience. I pray if there's a man or a woman here who has never transferred their trust from themselves to the Son of God, that this very moment where they are their prayer might be, Lord Jesus, I have sinned and I put my trust in you. Come into my life, invade my life, and you bring every thought captive to the word of God. I shall thank your thoughts after me. I shall thank your ways after you. Bring me to that point to where someday you shall bring all the universe 
And may this church, Lord, be one that men can walk in and women can walk in and see the adoration of God, the submission of his people of a good conscience, and the love of white men and black men and Hispanic men and Asian men and all men, of man and woman, young and old, rich and poor, bound around the commonality of the grace of God. And we'll ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. We have no ice cream, and for that I repent and I apologize. <laughs>